We're in John chapter 3 this morning, and John, the Apostle John, records for us a story between, of a conversation between two men. John chapter 3 is a tale of two men. It starts out for us in verse 1, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That's one of the two men in this conversation. And that verse tells us a lot about this man, Nicodemus. He was from the Pharisees. You will remember that the Pharisees, they kept the law to the letter. Every written law and every oral law, some of them weren't written down, but brother, you just knew that was a law and you kept the law. Every law, every one of them written down and oral, the Pharisees kept the law. And if you didn't happen to keep the law, then you would fall under the weight of the law. The Pharisees would come after you. This was Nicodemus. Back up to one, please. There's a man from the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. Now, he was a Jewish man, but the name Nicodemus was a, a Greek name. In other words, he was cultured and contemporary in the culture. The Romans were in charge of the world, and he'd been given a, a, a Greek name. And then he was a ruler of the Jews. Now, this was almost certainly the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council. Nicodemus sat on the council in Jerusalem. The council was made up of Pharisees and another group of folks, and they were in charge in Jerusalem. They were like the Supreme Court in Jerusalem. They were in charge. And so this man, Nicodemus, no doubt he had grown up well-educated man. He probably grew up in synagogue school. He went off and went to school. Maybe in his heart he said, I love the Old Testament law, and I want to go into full-time ministry or full-time whatever. And he goes to school and he's educated. And then he finds himself on the ruling council in Jerusalem. He is educated. He is articulate. He is one of those men who execute the law. This man decides that he is going to come. Verse 2. He comes. Uh, and this man came to him at night. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about why he came at night. It's almost certain that he decided to come at night because he really didn't want the rest of this council to know that he was going to have a conversation with Jesus. And so he shows up. Maybe it wasn't secretive. Maybe he just, in, in wisdom, decided, I'm just going to slide off and I'm going to find the man where this man's staying at. Remember, Jesus happened to be in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. I'm going to figure out where he's at. I'm going to follow him or whatever. He comes at night, perhaps, probably by himself. He comes to him at night and he says to him, Rabbi. Now, Rabbi, the Hebrew word, literally means my great one. So here is Jesus who's just shown up in town, and last week he saw that he came and he took a whip made of cords and he drove the money changers from the temple. Do you think the council at Jerusalem heard about that? Oh, absolutely. absolutely they heard about that. Do you think that Nicodemus was aware of this man and the signs that he had done? And he comes to him and he calls him my great one. Now I'll just, I'll just tell you. On the Sunday morning, Joe Moore's favorite title for me is Rabbi. <laughs> Sometimes he calls me Clay. Occasionally he calls me Pastor. But most of the time he calls me Rabbi. <laughs> my great one. And my heart swells with pride. <laughs> Nicodemus begins talking to Jesus my great one, we recognize and we see, we understand, we know me and my counsel. We, or at least some of us know, we know and we recognize that you have come from God as a teacher. Why? Because no one could perform these signs that you have done here in Jerusalem unless God were with him. Nicodemus is saying, sir, I, I've studied the Old Testament scriptures a long time. And I've been in synagogue. I've been in church 
all my life. And I've heard about people coming and people going and, and they're being prophets of God. And, and some of them, frankly, are fruitcakes. Some of them show up in town and they have this military coup and they're trying to get rid of the Romans. And we would love to have rid of the Romans. And so we pe see people coming through all the time. But the things that you've done, sir, we know that there is no chance that you could have done that unless God were with you. Now, if I had been Jesus <laughs> and Nicodemus came in and called me rabbi like Joe does, <laughs> I might have been tempted to think, yep, come on in, Nicodemus, let's have a cup of brew together. <laughs> Jesus says to him for the first time, Nicodemus makes three statements and Jesus responds with three statements. And he says to him in verse three, I assure you, if you have your King James Bible, it will say, verily, verily, truly, truly. Amen, amen, let it be so. I ush Nicodemus, Mike, will you be Nicodemus this morning? Yes, sir. Nicodemus, you, you can carry this one to the bank, my brother. Welcome to my little humble abode. You can carry this one to the bank unless a person is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that's not exactly the welcome I was expecting after me calling you uh, a rabbi. H how can these things be? Uh, 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 Nicodemus says in verse 4, how can this be? Can a man, when he is old, like me, can he, can he, can he be born? There was that, you know, that he chuckled and tried to gather his thoughts. That wasn't the conversation he was expecting to have. Is it, is it possible that a man like me, an old man, could be born? Can, can a man, verse 4, go ahead there. Can, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Now, for us, we hear this and we think, well, come on, Nicodemus. We know what that means. Come on, Nicodemus. It's pretty obvious, but, but Nicodemus just simply didn't get it. Verse 5, Jesus answered to him for the second time, I assure you, verily, verily, truly, truly, you can carry this one to the bank, Nicodemus. I assure you, unless somebody is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> the living water. Well, how did Nicodemus hear that? Well, I was born of water when my mother's water broke. That's a water birth. That's a physical birth. Uh, but you're telling me that I've got to be born physically and, and then be born by the Spirit? Well, we didn't talk about that very much in synagogue school. That wasn't didn't resonate. See, when I was born in the flesh, Jesus, I was born as a Jew. And you remember Father Abraham, don't you? And God told Abraham, all of your descendants, they are in the bloodline. And Jesus, I'm in the bloodline. I've been born. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in the line. I've been born. I'm a child of Abraham. I've been born of water. Unless somebody's born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said, Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, what's born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Nicodemus, don't be amazed or startled that I would say to you that you have to be born again. Let me see, Nicodemus, if I can draw you an illustration. Verse 8. Have you watched the wind blow, Nicodemus? The wind blows where it wants to. And you can hear it, but you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. For example, if the wind blew through recently through your town and it did some damage, maybe you had a storm and, and you didn't see the wind because you can't see you can't see the wind blow and you don't know where it's coming and you don't know where it's going, but I'm gonna tell you what, once the wind has passed. You can see the effects of the wind, can you not? About three times recently, I've gone and picked Dad up, and I've taken him around, driven him through town to see the effects of the wind. 
We didn't see the wind, didn't see it coming, didn't see it going. But whenever we got done seeing it, when the wind finished, we said, Oh, that's the effect of the wind. You don't know where it's, where, where, you don't hear it sound, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but that's what happens to a man who is born of the Spirit. Once the Spirit of God blows through Nicodemus, once the Spirit of God has come across you, you may not have seen the Spirit, but you know what it's like to see a man who's been touched by the Spirit of God. Amen. Don't be amazed that I would say that to you. Verse 9, Nicodemus once again. How can these things be? This is so different from everything that I learned in synagogue school. This is so different from everything that I've been taught. How can these things be, asked Nicodemus. Verse 10, Jesus says to, you, to him again, Nicodemus, you're a teacher in Israel? You, you've been to school and, and you've learned and had and owned all the schooling and you don't understand this? And then for the third, third time, Jesus says to him, I assure you, Nicodemus, verily, verily, truly, truly, I'm telling you, you can carry this one to the bank. We, my father and I, we speak what we know. And we, my father and I, testify to what we have seen. But you and your crew, having grown up in synagogue, having been so narrowly focused on the law and the letter of the law, you've missed the spirit of the law. You, Nicodemus, don't understand our testimony. Jesus said in verse 12, if I've told you about the things that happen on earth, like the wind example that I just gave you, and you don't believe me, how in the world, if I were to tell you about things that happen in heaven, how would you believe them, Nicodemus? Verse 13, no one has, asc no one has ascended into heaven except the one you know that Jesus pointed to himself in this conversation with Nicodemus. No one has made the round trip back and forth to heaven. No one has ascended in, into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, I'll tell you right now, Nicodemus, his jaw drops. He's shaking his head. He does not understand at this point. This does not match with what he learned in synagogue school or in Pharisee school. And then Jesus tries to draw another picture for him. He says to him, Nicodemus, do you remember the story back in the book of Numbers where the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and they started grumbling and complaining, God, why, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? And the Bible says that God sent snakes to the wilderness to discipline the people for grumbling and complaining. The Bible tells us, you can read this in Numbers, Numbers chapter 21, that those snakes began to bite people and they died. And the people went back to Moses and said, Moses, we have sinned for complaining. What should we do? And Moses goes to God and God says, Moses, here's what I want you to do in Numbers chapter 21. I want you to take bronze and I want you to make a serpent, the image of a serpent, and I want you to put it up on a pole. And everyone who gets bitten by that snake, if they will come and look, look on that serpent held up on the pole, they will be restored to physical health. Do you remember that verse 14? Do you remember that just he shrunk all of that story into this because Nicodemus remembered that story from Numbers 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, Nicodemus had no clue what Jesus was saying. As Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up as well. Verse 15. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. 
Just like lifting the snake up on the pole, if you looked at it, it would restore you to physical health. I'm telling you, Nicodemus, the Son of Man is going to be lift, lifted up, and whoever looks to him will have eternal life. And then you just know that this is when Jesus leaned in. <coughs> Nicodemus, God loved the world. God so loved the world. Nicodemus, I know that you've been stuck in your, steeped in your tradition and the rules and all the regulations, but I want to tell you that at the heart of the matter, God loved the world in this way. That he gave because God is a giving God, not a taking God. Nicodemus, God loved the world in this way. That he gave his only begotten Son, His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should never perish, but have eternal life. <coughs> Next verse. Verse 17. Jesus carries on. And He says that he says that God didn't send the Son of Man into the world to condemn the world, Nicodemus. And I understand that you said on the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, and day after day you find people who break the law and you execute the law and you execute judgment on them and you, frankly you bring them under the condemnation of the law. But I want to say to you that the Father didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world through Him might be saved. And then Jesus went on and shared some other things with Nicodemus. You can go read those words the rest of that passage. But I can't help but imagine that listening out of one ear, talking about truth and life and day and night, the rest of those verses through verse 21. At some point, Nicodemus takes his cup of brew and thanks Jesus and heads out into the night. I don't know if he went straight home. I don't know if he took the long way. And those words rang in his head. And rang in his head. And rang in his head and Finally, he gets to the front door of his house, and he walks in the front door of his house. And this happened this morning. I was imagining this in my mind, rehearsing this. And I was sitting in my chair with a cup of coffee, and I was staring at the floor, imagining Nicodemus. And Hope walks through the door, and she says, what's wrong with you? That's what Nicodemus is like. What? What happened to you? Oh, what's wrong with you, Nicodemus? You're white as a ghost. Uh, you're staring blankly in his face. What happens to you? And Nicodemus says, <coughs> Sweetheart, I think I just had a conversation with the Son of God. What did he say, Nicodemus? What did he say? Well, he talked about the law and he talked about Moses and, and then he, he said these words to me. Go back up, please. One, one. Uh, uh, go back one, up one. Sweetheart, he said these words to me. He told me that God loved the world in this way. That he gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him. Will not perish. But have. Eternal life. Amen. 
well, sweetheart, what else did he say? Well, he talked about Moses and the snake and how he was going to be lifted up. And I don't understand that. And he talked about day and he talked about night and he talked about truth and he talked about evil and he talked about, I don't know what else he said. I was just stunned by those words that God loved the world enough to give his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. Well, darling, what are you, what are you going to do? That's different from everything you've learned and that you've lived your whole life. What are you going to do? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I, I guess I'll get up and go to work tomorrow. I'll go back to the council and I'll continue on. And, and I don't know exactly what will happen. I, I know that my thinking will be different. So the Bible tells us that about a year and a half or two and a half years, sometime much later, Jesus had gone back up into Galilee and preached and he came back to Jerusalem. And here Nicodemus is still sitting on the Sanhedrin council at least a year later. Begin in John chapter 7 with verse 45. Jesus had preached a, spe a, a specially poignant message. And the people were getting all upset. And the Pharisees apparently had sent the temple police to arrest him. Verse 45. Then the temple police came back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you arrest him? Why, why haven't you brought him? And those temple police said, Y'all, nobody's ever spoken like this before. This guy has spoken the words of life. Then the Pharisees responded to them, Are you guys fooled too? Really? Really, you all temple police? We sent you on mission to arrest this guy, and you listened to one of his messages, and you didn't arrest him? Are you guys fooled too? Have any of the rulers of the Sanhedrin council or the Pharisees, have any of us been duped by his message? I don't think so. But this crowd, these people out here, they don't know the law. They are accursed. They are condemned under the law. Verse 50. Nicodemus, <laughs> the one who came to him previously, being one of them, the Sanhedrin still, <laughs> raised his hand and he said to them, don't, don't we have a due process here in Jerusalem? Doesn't our law, our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? I'm not sure we should arrest him just yet until we at first at least hear what he has to say. <laughs> Verse 52, you aren't from Galilee too, are you, Nicodemus? We didn't realize you were from up north up there. Don't you know that nothing good can come out of, uh, out of Galilee? Uh, in fact, you will see if you read the Old Testament, no prophet comes from Galilee. And then they dispersed, and each man went to his house. And Nicodemus' words in that moment, the words of truth about, a di uh, about the due process, it dissipated the emotion, and everyone went to their house. And in that case, Nicodemus still on the ruling council, still, on, still as a Pharisee, he speaks on behalf of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure what it means, but about three years from that first encounter, almost three years, we see him show up one more time in Scripture. And it's in John chapter 19, and you will remember this. After this, after what? Well, Jesus died on Friday afternoon about 3 o'clock on the cross. He'd been lifted up, and he died about 3 o'clock. But the religious people had to have their religious observance starting at 6 o'clock on Friday for the observance of the Sabbath. So we need to take care of business and get this insurrectionist. We need to get him out of here. We need to be done by 6 o'clock. And so by about 3 o'clock, Jesus dies on the cross. There was a fellow named Joseph of Arimathea, which was just northwest of Jerusalem. He also was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly 
kind of an underground disciple of Jesus because he was afraid of the Jews, and he was one of them as well, apparently. He asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission. Sure, there's one less body we have to worry about. One less body we have to throw in the heap. If you want his cotton-picking body, you can absolutely have it. So <coughs> Joseph came and took his body away. Verse 39, Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and alum. Let me just say, if I'm a 200-pound man, and you're going to bring myrrh and aloe to embalm my body, 75 pounds? That sounds a little bit extraordinary. Verse 40, then they took Jesus' body and they wrapped it in cloths with the aromatic spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. And there was a garden there in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden owned by Joseph of Arimathea. No one had yet been placed in it. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation and since the tomb was nearby. Let me just tell you how it happened. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea basically together served on the Sanhedrin. And they watched these proceedings. They heard the people shout, Crucify! Crucify! And probably Nicodemus and Joseph perhaps both tried to intervene on Jesus' behalf. And they saw that the tide of public opinion overwhelmed them. And, and he was going to be put to death and hung on a cross. Joseph and Nicodemus came to, together by the side and and they discussed, this is, this is not right, what happened, what's happening to this man. What, what, can we, what can we do? What can we do to help this family? What can we do to help this mom who's about to watch her son get executed on a cross and doesn't deserve it? And Joseph said, well, I'm aware of a tomb right here. I'll go purchase that tomb and I'll go talk to, to Pilate and see if we can have his body. And Nicodemus says, well, I'll try to go and see if I can round up some spices for the burial. After Jesus took his last breath, Joseph came up, no doubt, to Mary and John and those followers, Mary Magdalene, and said, Ma'am, my name is Joseph, and I'm very sorry about what happened in your family, but, but I have a tomb here locally, and, and I've talked to Pilate to see if we could secure his body, and, and if you're okay with that, we'll take his body, and, and we'll try our best to give him a proper burial. So they took his limp body down, and took it to that tomb and just as they approached the tomb around the corner came I don't know a donkey laden down with spices or a horse with a carriage or or maybe Nicodemus had a wooden cart that he was pulling behind 75 pounds of spices and oils to embalm this body <coughs> Nicodemus walks up and, and there's Jesus mama and at least John and the others surrounding the body in tears, beginning the long grief process. And I can see Nicodemus come up and put his arm on Mary's shoulder and say to, say to her, Ma'am, I'm very, very sorry about your loss. And we want to try to do our best that we can to give him a proper burial. And ma'am, I need to share a story with you. I had a conversation with your boy a couple of years ago. And I don't understand what's happened today while your son's body is here. And I don't know how it's going to turn out. But I need to share a word with you. Your son said to me three years ago, Ma'am, your son said to me, For God, so let the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should never perish, 
but will have eternal life. Ma'am, I believe. Will you pray? In this one amazing story we've heard today, two of perhaps the most amazing statements ever spoken in human history. Both of them by Jesus in this conversation. The first, you must be born again. And the second one, Jesus said, I've made a way for that to happen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I just want to say to you this morning, we're going to play the song Just As I Am. That's the song you heard at Billy Graham Crusades for all those years when Billy Graham shared that same story, the simple truth of the gospel, and people came in droves. And we don't do this very often. But you know what Just we just did today, Church 247? We just talked about John 3.16, the greatest news ever given. So I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey. Maybe you grew up in synagogue school or Sunday school. Or you've known the answers. You've known the rules, the written rules and the unwritten rules. And you've served on the committees and the councils. And you know the bylaws and the Constitution. But maybe today you've not ever been born again. Or I don't know where you're at on your journey. Maybe you walked through the door for the first time this morning. And today you have heard the words of life. I must be born again. And Jesus made that possible. The song is just as I am. Without any pleas. Without any excuses. Without any rationalization. I'm not going to try to clean myself up. I'm not going to try to get myself right first. Just as I am, just like Nicodemus, I come. And I'm going to be standing right here, and I don't often do that, but I'm going to invite you to come. It's not my invitation. If you're sitting there thinking, you know what, I probably need to walk down there and trust Jesus and get saved. It's not my invitation. That's his invitation to you. So will you stand with me as Greg plays this song, Just As I Am? I'd be thrilled. Several of us would be thrilled to meet you right here today. And I just say to you that the first time Nicodemus heard that story, he didn't rush down the aisle of the church. Took him a long time on that journey to get to that place. And if God has spoken to your heart today, He can speak to your heart just as clearly laying on your bed at night with your head on your pillow as He can right here in church. If you decide at some point you want to come and secretly have a conversation with the pastor or the rabbi, you're welcome to call me that. If you'd like to come and have a conversation with that, I would certainly be honored to do that. God bless you. Let's stand together. Be dismissed. Probably ought to reach and grab a hand of somebody. Can we do that? Circle up to somebody. <laughs> Father, we consider ourselves greatly blessed by your hand. We love you, Father. Father, would you help us this week? Would you give us an opportunity this week to go tell somebody what great thing you have done in our lives? And then would you give us courage to take advantage of that opportunity? We love you because you loved us first and sent your son to die in our place. We call out, hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Praise the blessed.